Smiling readiness, you are live. Okay, all right. Funny, funny things. Roof, very funny things from the background there. So changes. Oh well, I'll try to be too clever with the, the destinations. I'm saving these things out to. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for joining us today. Right. Um, thank you for everyone else for uh, for bearing with us. That's why we've set up a little bit of sharing for the first time. Um, I'm Peter Holland. I've got the great honour of being the uh, brand ambassador for Foursquare Rum here in the UK. And Foursquare Rum, of course, includes Taylor's Velvet for Learnham, of which today is all about. So uh, this was kind of an inspiration because uh, a year or so ago we enjoyed a wonderful presentation at Tales of the Cocktail, and I've really been itching to share such a thing again. So, Richard, please. I've got my corn and all. I don't pretend so. I'm not going to do any more drinking. I got yeah, talking. I'm just going to sit here and sip on this thing and in, in, enjoy. So, over to you, sir. Right. Yes. And so, for the first time, we're going to try and put in a few slides because um, I went for learning was kind of lots of nice old stuff to show. Um, one of the to sort of start off here, I have, these are my oldest references to Falernum. Um, the one on the left is an ad from a newspaper of the period. Uh, it's from 1821. It was a, a Bridgetown Mercury uh, Gazette. Um, have I still got you? Um, yes, I, I, I removed us from it so we could focus on the thing, but I'm, I'm going to move us back in as soon as we're needed. <laughs> Don't oh, you worry. Okay, because once so people can see. Yeah, I mean, the key thing really is you have to read all the detail. Of course, w one of the other things you'll read on the ad is you see the headline of Madeira. So that's one of the reasons why I keep banging on about Madeira. Madeira was a big thing, and we'll see a reference to Madeira as well uh, a little later. But So on the left... And then on the right, uh, arguably slightly older because it's January, but this one is in um, this is in a, a auction in uh, Bristol. So this is some goods seized for non-payment. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It's kind of the buyers, but in that list of, of goods, seized is, uh, some. so the the, the thing about it, this is it's extremely old. Uh, it pro very possibly goes back to the 17th century because we know in the 17th century records we have tons and on a typical estate uh, they are making rum uh, making rum and sugar but they're also making lots of lime juice back in even the 17th century and so Falerna may very well go back there but this is certainly evidence that by 1821 Falerna is, is well known I got another reference here slightly later but I, I was able to put the whole um newspaper in there is the barbadian another uh newspaper from the era and this uh, uh 1823 and again you can see the local um uh shop is advertising madeira and of course it's also advertising old rum you can see a uh, reference there to old rum even uh, even back uh batavia iraq but so even back in 1823 uh, you know, today we always get those discussions about when rum's going to premiumize. Well, here it is, premiumized back in 1823. So you have that, and then you do have it being well exported by 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 the 19th century. These are some of my oldest references to to exports. Obviously, the 1821 is a seized custom, so that must have been export. But here's 1887, Falernum liqueur, and this actually tells you what it is. It's made of rum lines. And cane sugar, and um, and Falernum strong water, which is kind of interesting because it's not as strong as spirits, but obviously it's stronger than water. Um, so there's some of my earliest uh, references. One of the things I, I, I sort of wanted to say at the outset for for why we do these kind of um, why we I've been trying to do more about Falernum because it, it kind of amazes me. Um, well, I shouldn't say this. Much, but anyway. it's very interesting. You know, authenticity and all the and for the next book, you know, I, I mean, um, there was a little flutter on the line from Sorry? our end, anyway, on the audio okay. side. The audio. Well, I, just, I just want to give a little, a little, a little background to some of the frustrations that we we go there, and um. You know, I make rum obviously here at Foursquare, and I have no shortage of people 
asking for advice about rum making. But one of the things that amazes me with all the people out there that make for learn, I've never had a single person ever ask me or ask any Barbadian authority whatsoever about Falernum. They all feel that, you know, Google is far better than any actual real Barbadian source. And this is this just amuses me incredibly. Um, and there were two 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 there are two illustrations of this point which 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 really strike at the heart of, 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 of the, the, the challenges. And let me precede them by saying if you in your cocktails have some Falernum inspired version of Falernum and you make a drink and you like your drink, press on. I am not, I know nothing about cocktail making. I am not here to tell you what you're using your cocktails. I'm not here to argue you should be using uh, Barbadian Falernum over anything else. I'm just going to tell you about Barbados Falernum and some of the challenges. So, one of the challenges I came across was I had one literal bar consultant say to me, when I was trying to explain to him what authentic Falernum was, he sort of said that the response was, I'm talking about the tiki syrup made by bartenders, not Barbados Falernum. So, I mean, that pretty well sort of encapsulated the kind of oblivious ignorance that we have out there. And then I think that was actually topped recently with a brand. And again, I'll stress here when people do things like this, out of, they do things out of ignorance, not out of malice. So here's a brand, and this brand is advertising that it's Don Beach's original formula of Falernum. So we've we've gone so far down the rabbit hole that not only is Don Beach not using Falernum that he discovered in Barbados on his travels, but he too was like a modern day bartender that made Falernum. And what's worse is this recipe is available on the internet. <laughs> So this is the kind of absurd absurdity we get with 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 Falernum. So that's kind of my little precursor. The, part of the problem of, with also with Falernum, of course, is that we don't know all the answers because these things are not all so well written down. Um, you know, I grew up with Falernum. Um, basically, the, 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 I'll show you a couple of slides. Losing the uh, audio then again. We still, we still got you there, Richard. But we, again, there was a flutter in the audio then. I don't know whether anyone caught that last part or not. We also got a freeze on the screen, which is slightly worrying as well. Still... Can you hear me all right? Uh, you've just come back again. Yeah, I, I, I know how to solve it now. I was on the wrong Wi Fi. <laughs> so it should be smooth. Cool. It should be smooth. So, uh, where was I? So we had just let um, uh, Don beat his original Falernum as, uh, yeah. as found on the internet. Yeah. So, yeah, as Don made it back in the day. So as a brand, yeah. So, and uh, as I, said, I want to stress, you know, a lot of these things, they're not done out of malice. They're, they're, they're done sort of, sort of out of ignorance. But, yeah, and, and sorry, and the problem with for learning for us, of course, a lot of these, this history is not written down. It's pretty hard to, 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 to piece it all together. And, of course, I grew up with Falerna because, um, you know, it's a very pervasive product in Barbados, certainly back in the day. I mean, it's maybe a little less pervasive now, but... Um, it every rum blender did for learn and 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 that's a little bit of a evidence about its origins so one of the things again that was um is misunderstood about for learn origins um apart from it not being a, a tiki syrup of bartenders uh is the idea that it was some kind of homegrown you know uh, recipe and you know and then you know Someone, you know, people came along and commercialized it, and, that, and that, that's not actually accurate at all. Um, and and then, of course, never made any sense to me because I appreciate in a country like Barbados, um, nobody buys what you make at home. I mean, I mean, okay, maybe the last twenty years we're now so luxurious, uh, but you're talking about a country that you know, thirty, forty years ago, fresh chicken came from the backyard. 
not from the local supermarket. Um, so the notion that 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 homegrown for learning would disappear and we would be so rich and affluent a society in our little poor developing country that we would nip and buy for learning is, is a, a huge mistake. Certainly I grew up, we never made for learning at home. Um, you know, my, my father or grandfather never made for learning at home. Um, it's, it, it's not linked. What is linked to making it home is a corn and oil, but we'll get to that one. <laughs> And it obviously wasn't invented by a single commercial operation because all of the brands uh, bottled Falernum. Uh, as we'll see, I'll show you a bottle of Ma Martin Dorley Falernum, I'll show you a bottle of Matt Gay Falernum. And there was an RL Seal Falernum, and there was an R Ali Nathan Falernum. There was loads of Falernums. Um, so that meant there was not some single commercial origin. So what my suspicion is, is that Falernum was originally made on the estate. That's where all the ingredients were. And the same way the, the rum migrated from Sugar Estate to Bridgetown Bottling, so did Falerno. And that's why it went hand in hand with bottled rum. So as rum moved from, you know, a, a sort of unmarked demijohn on the estate to purchasing a bottle in Bridgetown, so did, so did Falerno. Um, so that, that's, that's where I, I see the origins. And then in terms of the recipe, it, it seems to me that the original recipe was rum, sugar, and, and lime juice. There was no no uh, spices. The spices came much later. Um, I've spoken to some of the original blenders of different brands of Falernum, and some of these very famous brands were just rum, lime, and sugar, but a little bit more on that later. Um, so... I just want to show you here. Here's one again, another really, really early reference to Falernum um, from uh, this literary journal all year round. Charles Dickens, not the Charles Dickens, but his son. And in the it references in the spiritist drinks, the one uh, relished in Barbados is the bitter, of which there are two distinct varieties. The proper basis of both is Falernum, a curious liqueur comprised from lump, rum, and lime juice. So we have it. A hint already by the late 19th century that one of the ways for learning is being used is in cocktails and I'll talk about that there are two well famous pre tiki era cocktails and uh, one is the Royal Bermudian uh, Yacht Club cocktail and one of course is corn and oil um, sorry there's three um, I'll explain why corn and oil is, is a latter day um, rum and for drink um, the other one is the green swizzle which was invented in the Bridgetown Club, so I'll talk about that. But we do have a little insight here as to how Falernum was drunk. Uh, here is a social history being uh, published in 1842, and again we see this lovely reference to Madeira, and it's telling you, um, you know, basically on very festive occasions, uh, out would come the good stuff that would be Madeira. Uh, but your sort of daily um, wine was, if you like, uh, Falernum or, or Punch. And um, it shows you that, uh, you know, today we see it as a, you know, sort of a, a cocktail ingredient. But back in the day, you know, the day before um, people, you know, when people died before they got diabetes, they weren't adverse to um, or other chronic uh, diseases from, from excess intake. They weren't, you know, adverse to drinking very sweet things like Falernum. Um, you know, and I think especially in the in the 17th and 18th century, so even earlier than this, where sugar was really, uh, you know, I mean, people brought sugar as gifts. Uh, you know, sugar was it was a sort of really um, incredible and marvelous um, invention or a discovery. So here now is a little example also on the slide. As they say, back in the day, everybody did for learning. Uh, we can talk a little bit about more about the words uh, white falernum. Liqueur um, falernum, I think, was just sort of um, a bit of a marketing term. You should see the term both liqueur falernum and liqueur rum, basically meaning it was very good quality. And John D. Taylor, of course, everyone knows John D. Taylor as falernum, but John D. Taylor was a rum blender, just like Ali Natha or Martin Dorley or any of them. Um, what's happened is, is that his Falernum was um, notoriously good and it survived. And 
So John D. Taylor was actually acquired by Ali Natha and Ali Natha uh, sold the stock bottle in there for Learnham and bottled John D. Taylor's for Learnham. And when we bought John D. Taylor's for Learnham, we stopped bottling RL Seal for Learnham. Um, and uh, continue with John D. Taylor's for Learnham. So we've actually done a few for Learnhams over the years. And again, here are some ads from back in the day. These ads are from the 50s. There's Ali Natha advertising their rum wine for Learnham. And yes, we would have they made all kinds of um, the, the rum bottlers in those days, bottled, we bottled all kinds of things. So we would import, you know, um, wine flavorings and make, you know, cheap wines. Today you can still buy in some of the Caribbean islands, cherry brandy and well, and these things are just made with, you know, flavor and essences and alcohol. So everyone bottled these things, but there it is, rum wine in Falernum, John D. Taylor advertising their rum. Um, and then here is a reference to the annual industrial exhibition. So we didn't have uh, rum competitions back in the day. We used to have annual exhibitions and everything was exhibited, everything. I'm talking about there was a dog show, there was goats. You'd exhibit stalks of sugar cane. You'd exhibit rum, Falernum. And uh, John D. Taylor, uh, um, I, I should have did that little clip. But John D. Taylor, um, a little clip in I have where John D. Taylor is winning first prize at the annual exhibition for their filler. Super. I'm quite excited to try some of the other ones just to see just how good John, see John D. Taylor is there on Robert Street. That's where we were as well. All of these rum blenders back in the day were, were on Robert Street. Um, uh, and you know, because that's where all you know, again, very English. The English understand this very well. Everything on the same street, you know, like you know, Savile Row or Harley Street or whatever. That's very typical of Barbados. Um, copy that. And here's the other reference to this another, this very famous pre tiki era um, cocktail called the Green Swizzle. And this one here is being covered in the 1908 San Francisco. Um, here's a chronicle. Um, this was actually invented the Bridgestone Club. Now, to give that some perspective, the Bridgestone Club was kind of like your Institute of Directors on Paul Mall kind of thing club, or one of your like one of your you know you know your Paul Mall clubs. So this was a uh, club in the in Bridgetown, um, where basically all of the who's who, big shot men only. Um, club and so it shows you in, in, in the beauty of Falernum again and this is so typical in the, in the Caribbean you have the same product being used by different classes of society but in different ways so a bottle of Falernum in a you know, working class home was a sort of a little bit of medicinal treat and you know in a well to do home it was part of you know green swizzle cocktail served in a bar at the, at the local club where where they had lunch. Um, so that, that kind of shows you, um, so here, here, here's right, here's a, a note of West Indies drinks, Times, London, 1910, um, to Green Swizzle, commonly known as the Green Indigenous to the Barbers, Bridgetown Club, so here's an actual reference where it shows it originates there. Because similar versions did um, spread around. We know a, a similar version um, spread over to Trinidad, and again was also drunk at you know the Queen's Park, the legendary Queen's Park Hotel. Again, that was kind of the the you know that was kind of like the Savoy of of Port of Spain, Trinidad. Um, uh, in Barbados, with the stage of virtue therapy, and otherwise a Falernum, a vermouth-like liquor, the basis of which is uh, wormwood. Now, the basis of Falernum is not wormwood. The basis of the, the Green Swizzle is uh, wormwood bitters. So here's my little summary. This is what we did at, at um, this is what we did at, at uh, Tales for the WSET seminar. So I sort of did a what is and what is not for learning. Uh, so what is a rum and lime juice based liqueur indigenous to Barbados? It's low in proof. So again, we see some people today creating some falernums um, with very you know bizarre uh, strengths. Uh, historically, there was basically just enough strength in there to preserve that lime and sugar stabilize it and you know people back then too they wanted the sweetness they didn't want the you know anything you know straight spirits were called hot hot you know they wanted smoothness so 
the, the alcohol is in there preserving this lime and sugar, you know, um, nectar. Uh, and so these were never very, very strong. And we'll see some further evidence of that as well. Um, and again, all of the historical records, as much as I can find, points to it being rum, lime juice, and sugar. Um, spices seems to be a latter-day invention, and that may have come when it moved to Bridgetown with the blenders, because with the blenders in Bridgetown, they would have been, you know, importers of these different things. Um, why they chose what they chose is a very good question, but it seems to me it was uh, originally bitter almond, which got replaced because that's um, dangerous. So it got replaced with basically an uh, uh, almond oil, which is an almond substitute, which actually has nothing to do with almonds. So it is actually not um, uh, it is not uh, dangerous if you have a nut allergy. We get that question a lot. Clove. Now, clove is hugely popular in West Indian cooking. So that probably the one I can best explain is clove. I mean, we absolutely... There's no West Indian uh, household uh, without uh, clove. I cook with clove all the time. And it seems to me it was either nutmeg or mace. Mace is the outer shell of the nutmeg. Um, that to, that's all I can find. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of why I think uh, ginger got in there. I'll, I'll show you. But I, I have no evidence. Now, no evidence is not, you know, not proof it never happened. So there might have been some falernum out there with ginger and cinnamon and allspice and who knows. I just haven't, speaking of an old blender and being familiar with a couple of them, um, falernum was a little bit like, like Robert's Rum. They weren't wildly different. It wasn't like you, you found one falernum was a cinnamon falernum and then another falernum was a ginger falernum. They were all pretty well in that in that ballpark. And certainly the always the predominant was the, was the, was the, the almond. Now, the name, um, there's always this uh, apocryphal story about you have to learn them. Um, I've become more, when I first heard the suggestion that it came from Falernian wine, I dismissed it completely. Um, the reason why I've been a little more open to it is because, one, yes, the English is Falernian, but the Latin is Falernum. And two, as I realized how much older Falernum is, you know, growing up, we used to think of Falernum as being late 19th century. Now there's, it's definitely 18th century, possibly earlier. And if there's one thing colonists did was to name things from back home. Now, of course, you didn't have Falernum, Falernum wine back in England in the 17th century, but certainly you would have had the, the um, legend of it. And so, therefore, you, you're a colonist. You make this uh, wonderful lime and, uh, and sugar and rum concoction. And so, of course, you, you think to the, the greatest compliment you can possibly think of. So you name it after the, the legendary uh, Falernum wine of ancient Rome. And, you know, the early colonists, um, while I'm not going to say they behaved very biblically, they were, um, you know, Church was one, well, actually, there's a lot of complaints. They didn't go to church as they should. But the point is, there was a lot of efforts in early, you know, 17th century colonization to, you know, sort of spread the word, the, the biblical word. So they were familiar with um, writings from biblical era and things like that. And so they, they, there's no reason why a lot of English colonists would not have been familiar with the notion of this famous. Um, nectar of the gods sort of falernum wine so that it's it's a it's it is a believable story that is where the name come from but i don't think i'll ever find a, a conclusive bit of evidence so what is falernum is not this is kind of just as much as in, just as uh important as what it is so yeah it was not developed by bartenders sorry guys um it's not a tiki syrup it's a lot 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 older than that uh it was not a homemade product um i think too with this you have to kind of grasp how central plantation life was in the 1780s and 19th century i mean um uh, the only person who really had a home in which they could make something at home would have been you know the the, the plantation owner um, so you're talking really something that's made on the estate, not a, not a sort of folk recipe. Um, so John D. Taylor's Falernum, you know, is not 
it's, no Barbadian would consider that a commercial version of Falernum. They just that's a brand of Falernum. In the same way, you know, Martin Dorley is a brand of rum. They don't see Martin Dorley's rum or Four Square rum as 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 something we made at home, commercialized. And and Falernum in Barbados is very much seen that way. Um, as I say, I've never heard of anyone um, making Falernum at home, other than in the same way we have quirky people who make beer and stuff at home. Yes, I'm sure there's there's loads of people who try to make Falernum at home, but what I mean is it's not really a cultural thing. Uh, I've not come across any evidence that there was ginger, oil, spice, or cinnamon. I mean, all spice is very much a Jamaican thing. Um, and I'll tell you where I think the, where the, because one of the things with the American recipes that are sort of on the internet, you see this ginger being pervasive. And I, I think I have a, a, a explanation for that. So yes, there's this one for learning number nine. I mean, these are just uh, internet fables. Because one of the things about Falernum recipes, they were very, very closely guarded secrets. I mean, when we bought John D. Taylor's, you know, the handing over that recipe, you would think they were handing over the recipe to Coca-Cola. Um, yes, I mean, these things were done, uh, you know, sort of kept in a safe deposit box. And I mean, so so Falernum blenders took enormous pride in in uh, keeping their, um, their uh, recipes confidential. When I did speak with one blender who was in his 80s, and he did one brand back in the day, uh, and he's well in his 80s, and I and he sort of said, "No, it was just you know um, lime juice, rum, and sugar," and he couldn't he couldn't remember the the, the ratios. And I said to him, "Sure, he sure was nothing else." And he said, "Well, I'm 80 something. I might have forgotten, but um, you know, uh, there wasn't a you know he couldn't remember anything else." And so yeah, so so one of the, the frustrations is is that that we see all these products out there, um, you know, named for Learnham and they have no connection to Barbados and not been a, they, they you know the sourcing the you know it's it's you know if I went out and I tried to make an American product or an English product or a Scottish product, I mean, I'd like to at least consult, you know, I mean, uh, you know, an Englishman or whatever. I mean, I I go home and I make French sauces, but the the sources of my French sauces, you know, you know, they go back to, you know, classic French, you know, Escoffier and etc. I mean, we do try to, I do try to do them authentic. Whereas Falernum seems to be anything goes. Um, it's a little bit like the proverbial rum has no rules, but apparently Falernum has no rules. <laughs> and then one of the one of the great um, one of the great uh, heresies that I saw out there. And 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 gained a lot of traction is when I saw people making corn and oil, and they came up with this idea that you have to make it with this, this dreadful thing called blackstrap rum, and it has to go on as some kind of float. And I was like, oh my god! I mean, this is a complete fable. I mean, my father, on my father's side, drank corn and oil, and my grandfather on my mother's side drank corn and oil. I know what a bloody corn and oil is. <laughs> and this gets pervasive. I mean, and, and you see it. And, and, and even when some people make corn and oil mostly right, rum and falernum, and then they all chuck this bloody dark rum on the top and say, oh, I thought that. As I'll explain, the oil has nothing to do with dark color. We'll get there. So this guy is why Falernum is really around today. So Falernum, as I say, was in cocktails in the, in the Caribbean before um, Dom Beach, but he visited the Caribbean um, in his travels. He visited Polynesia, he visited the Caribbean, and he loved everything Polynesian. That's why he themed his bars uh, uh, with Polynesian theme. But all of his drinks were inspired by West Indian drinks. I mean, his foundation, foundation, uh, foundational principle is based on you know planter's punch and he dimensionalized from there and so he dimensionalized you know the rum part by using the, the multiple rums in a different in different ways and he multi and he dimensionalized his, his sweet part with falernum and he learned about falernum in in when he you know in in the islands and because falernum was mainly a barbarous but as i'll show you it was around in a few other islands as well so it's not necessary that he he, he found it in barbarous but he may have and so and it was one of his earliest secrets. So here's his uh, one of his recipe books. And so eventually he'd code everything. 
that he knew to code Falernum very early, and so he'd write it backwards. So it was, you know, he because it, I mean, that was it. His whole principle, uh, again, I'm not a cocktail historian, but you, you can see that his principle is basically dimensionalizing stuff. So instead of adding sugar syrup, let's add falernum. So he, he, he'd add that kind of secret extra uh, dimension to, 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 to whatever he's using. So that's why falernum was so attractive to him. And of course, then that's how he ended up in all these famous old drinks. And that's why we talk so much about Fleurin today, because of this sort of authenticity. I mean, here's 1934, and that's thanks to Don Beach. Here's an article in the um, uh, New Yorker where they are complaining bitterly that they cannot get uh, Falernum, genuine Barbados Falernum. Um, he, he literally wants to pick it. Um, he's advising people to, to pick it, their favorite establishments, with give us Falernum placards. Um, and he says, oh, I love this line, he cannot but conclude, therefore, that those who deal in rum people utterly without charity or humanitarian instincts. So we think today people are upset when they can't find, you know, four square nobility. But believe me, back in the day, they're ready to picket the bloody place if they couldn't find some, some Falernum. So there you go. The more things change, the more things remain the same. And of course, he does describe it as, um, he does say it's a sin qua non, the rum swizzle, slightly alcoholic syrup again. So again, the legitimate, legitimacy of the, 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 the small alcohol. And he says it marries rum and lime juice into a model of domestic felicity. So again, he doesn't talk about, you know, ginger and cinnamon and all these kind of things. Now, so where did that ginger stuff come from? Well. This was a book published in 1948, and this is one of these classic um, uh, textbooks. And I think basically any bartender um, should know this. This is this is a, one of these sort of seminal uh, works. And he writes, Falernum, this syrup has scarcely enough alcoholic content to class as a liqueur. Proof runs from 12 to 18, so that's 6 to, to 9%. Again, this is consistent with what we know in Barbados. Uh, Velvet Falernum was introduced as this premium version of Falernum, and it had this whopping, crazy 11% alcohol. Um, it's a heavy white syrup. Again, it's, a, you know, it's quite a light color, because one of the things when you look at the old Falernums, you find an old ball of Falernum very dark, because that's oxidation. Um, it, you, know, a, 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 you know, white a Falernum is relatively light in color. And then over years, it will turn black. You go enough years, you it will turn black. Aromatic in color with a distinct almond flavor. So again, we, we always have this very, very strong evidence for, for, for the almond. And here he writes, and just a faint suspicion of ginger. Now that to me is kind of like an oxymoron because ginger is never faint or suspicious. Um, but I think that's the source of why people think it was ginger. So I don't think there's ever ginger in there, um, but he wrote a, a, a faint suspicion with ginger. Excellent with rum drinks, particularly in combination with lime juice, but blends better with Jamaica and other heavier body rums. And that, of course, makes perfect sense because by this time in 1948, we would have been making, it was very deliberate to make your Falernum with a very light rum, like not a really, you know, not a pot still rum, you know, with column stills, the, you know, there's at least three column stills in Barbados in this era, and this is the dominant. So that, that makes total sense. So here is an ad uh, from... Well, again, around this sort of height of the Tiki era or the early Tiki era, 1937. And again, you see it's 18 proof, 9%. 9%. Now, what I want to show you here is kind of the evolution a little bit of what it means to be genuine Falernum. So here's a 1938 ad, Falernum, the essential sweetener for all rum drinks. So again, you can see very much the style image is being used. Um, over in Nevada State Journal, 1939, uh, notice where the words now, the original and genuine Falernum. So history today is just repeating the past. Falernum comes around, Don the Beach probably has the genuine stuff, and everyone is trying to advertise they also have the original and genuine stuff. And as we'll see, what is original and genuine is, um, um, what's the word today, a truthiness. 
Yes, um, doesn't have a high dose of truthiness to it. Um, so there, because if we look here, this 1940 ad, the genuine flirtum. So again, you can see this emphasis to, to promote that they have the real thing. So, but check the bottom line, original Barbados formula. So this is not Barbados Falernum. This is somebody mimicking. And we can see this on the brand, if you look at the picture on the right, composed of cane sugar syrup, citric acid, which is not legit, but I know why it would have been done. That was a, a kind of a flavor enhancer. And so being made over in America, now being influenced by sort of American food techniques, they would have said, hey, we need to put a little citric acid in there. Alcohol, only 5%. Well, because, you know, we want to make it cheaper. But notice this alcohol, no more rum, rum's gone. Um, flavoring and specially compounded, no preservatives or color matter. So we can see how we've gone from the real thing in the 30s to the mimic thing by the 40s. So sometimes when I tell you, if you want your tiki drink to taste like an authentic tiki drink, I have to really speak about which era because already by the 40s, you're not got genuine um, falernum uh, in your cocktails. And I'll show you that here. Here's some falernum exports. So back in 1924, um, Bermuda, as you can see, is a big buyer of, uh, and that legacy is right through to today. So Bermuda was a very large buyer of rum, Gosling, used to bought a lot of Barbados rum. You might have even seen some advertised up here. Yeah, no. No, no. But you can see some old ads of Gosling's Barbados rum back in the day. And there is Gosling's to this day does bottle a Falernum product. They call Falernum. And that's probably the closest thing to a legit Falernum outside of Barbados as you get because you have this long history. And Guyana used to import a lot of Falernum back in the day. But notice back in 1924, height of prohibition. Obviously, none is going to America. It's a little bit going to some of the other islands. Now, post prohibition, and everyone's back drinking again, and you know, and cocktail culture is spreading as well. I mean, it's 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 a it's a it's a much better era. So suddenly now, look, we're exporting it to to the United Kingdom, we're exporting to Canada. Uh, Bermuda's, you know, it's absolutely you know flying in Bermuda. Um, these are good times, and the United States is starting to take a certain significant amount. And so the only reason why. The United States learn, is taking any Florida at all is purely because of, of Don the Beach Gomer Tiki. This is what creates this demand from nothing. But the sad thing is, is that by the 1940s, we're not exporting any Florida anymore because they're all mimicking it. And the, the, we don't, all the Florida that's sold in America by the 1940s is no longer authentic by West Florida. And it's a kind of a textbook case of you know one of the you know how why we discuss issues like the like the like the gi and stuff today because it, this is literally a product that on merit went to the drinks came from barbados and then was completely replaced by a hundred percent american-made product using the name and using the barbados name and not only using that but calling it genuine <laughs> So that's the kind of thing we're trying to fight now with rum. So this is just my little um, uh, summary here at the time, but I'm going to skip on to that, to the good old corn and oil. So corn and oil, where did the name come from? Well, first, let me tell you how old corn and oil is. This is corn and oil is really old. This is a 1911 recipe book. And in there is a recipe for corn and oil. And you'll notice it doesn't take rum. And it also shows you why it was kind of the drink of the world to do. Um, not that my, my grandfather was, was particularly well to do, but it would have been a kind of an aspiring drink. In other words, just like, a, you know, I'll drink a gin and tonic. It's, a, it's, a, it's an aspiring drink. So originally, it was made with brandy and falernum. And what I suspect happened was, it's, um, it's 1911. Uh, by 1914, we wouldn't have been able to get brandy anymore. And um, they replaced it with rum. And today, uh, so there's your classic original corn and oil. So where did the name corn and oil come from? Well, this actually, I didn't come up with this idea at first. This was uh, an article written, written by um, uh, uh, David Stolt, um, suggested this. And I believe this 100% because 
again, um, even though Robinus didn't necessarily um, follow all of the tenets of the Bible, they certainly were familiar with them. And um, uh, so, and so here is this this uh, Deuteronomy eleven thirteen and fourteen, and it basically sort of saying, you know, if you um, if you uh, follow the uh, follow onto my commandments. Um, you know, the, the the Lord will hand you down the, the, the corn, thy wine, thy oil. So drinking this this incredible rum and falernum drink or brandy and falernum was basically as good as if you were blessed with everything you could possibly need. And it's certainly consistent with, you know, falernum also being named after, you know, sort of mythical, um, near mythical, but it was a real wine. Um, or more mythical status of of falernum wine. Um, so, because you got to imagine that, you know, if you're a seventeenth century, um, Barbadian, well, they didn't call themselves Barbadian, but and you're drinking something with, you know, put, with sugar for the first time in your life, it's going to be um, it's going to be a, a incredible experience. Um, so this is why these emotive um names came about or at least, at least that that's what i think so that's it really that's um you know sort of my hopefully clearing up some things on on, on falernum and what is falernum and what's not falernum um so i don't know if you want to do some some questions you have some questions from your side or questions yeah, yeah, some uh, questions come through we did have a few questions, questions. Yeah. Seem to have got somebody might have. Right, wonder, make sure that we haven't got a doubling up. I do see one. What makes it a velvet for learning? I, I believe that was just a marketing term. Um, Johnny Taylor very famously did um, their core for learning was white for learning, uh, as as everyone did, and they basically launched a premium premium for learning, and they named it velvet for learning. As he said, the, the very another common word in the era to signify that something was really very 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 good was to say liqueur so we had products sold as liqueur for learning we had products sold as liqueur rum very common in barbers very common in jamaica uh if you remember those old ray and nephew labels they say liqueur rum and another word was velvet uh so saying velvet for learning was just a kind of a saying this is the high quality yeah kind of smooth it is this thing, this is also that little squeeze of lime that we hear about a lot. Um, you know, people making the corn and oars with lime. I never add lime to mine because there's lime in the uh, in the falernum. But uh, I do like a little dash of bitters. How how do you feel about bitters, please, Richard? Yeah, well, that, that's what I mean. Like any classic cocktail, you know, they evolve, and you know, someone putting a splash of lime, fresh lime in a in a in a corn and oil is. Um, how we say, you know, it's in the spirit of the drink, so it's, it's not an issue. And then bitters um, just needs to be one of those things where, you know, it became incredibly popular to sort of, you know, everything gets improved with a dash of bitters, bitters and so corn and oil was no, no, uh, no different. Um, so, yeah, today, I mean, my father will have his corn and oil with bitters, absolutely. So, I mean, it's, I can't say it's, you know, if I, if I find the earliest reference, 19... 9-11, I, I can't say it's there, but I don't I don't see anything anything wrong with it. Um, it's really, Dan's questionnaire, your your corn and oil spec, and all the time I've known you, you've never given you've you've never given Yeah, that. because it's a little bit again when you have some of these classic um, you know recipes, they, they evolve and, and people have their own spin and taste and, and change. So, you know, what we think today might be too sweet you know, a hundred years ago was not too sweet. The, the original recipe is definitely half rum, half learn. But for me, I like rum with a dash of learn. That's my corn and oil. Um, don't forget as well, like the way my father will have it, he'll have it with quite a bit of ice. So even though he is, I don't think he's quite half learn. I'll have to check with my mother, but even though his might be on the sweet side, he'll counteract that by the fact that he, because what he'll do is he put crushed ice in it. So, you know, when you're in Barbados, crushed ice kind of melt, you know, it's going to melt pretty quickly. And, I'll, and that will, so, um, and again, of course, crushed ice is, you know, again, now that's also a modern, 
a modern modification, but that's very common for people to, I mean, that's how I grew up knowing corn laws, rum, flarnum, crushed ice. All right, well, great, uh, great question there from Chris. I All suspect right. we're, uh, we're a war one. I suspect 1914 um, broke it, yeah. Yeah, fair play. Cool. Uh, oh, there's one there from, I think that covers, you at, uh, this is probably more of a technical. We have got a bit of a, a book running on um, anyone asking uh, the, the the recipe, please, for uh, John D. Taylor's. So far, no one. I don't think anyone's asked it yet. So um, we're, we're not doing very well because <laughs> four four times was going to be. <laughs> do you use actual lime juice? Sorry. Do you actually use lime juice, fresh lime juice, in your uh, when you no. make your learnum? That's a secret. Can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> nothing uh, changed. The question, when and why Falernum became popular again? Um, that's with the re cocktail revival. So I call sort of the 1970s and 80s the dark ages because people drank rum and Coca Cola and went to pubs and ordered beer. Um, from about the 2000s on, we've seen a wonderful revival of cocktail culture, cocktail bars. And so Falernum goes right with that. Okay. Well, oh, I think it's wonderful. We did have a, uh, I do recall um, a few years back, well, five, six years ago, there was a, a, a delay of Falernum into the UK. Mauricio or something, I had a, maybe they'd ordered it a little bit late. And uh, I remember standing in, uh, the, the bartenders in London were panicking. I stood in, in Play the Happiness with Gail, going like, yeah, the rumor is that, that Richard's not making Falernum anymore. And it's like we told this her, and, like, and she showed me the text message back from you, going like, no, it's on its way or something. You know, it's fine, don't worry about it. But like, it, there was a flutter of panic around, and people, I remember people rushing to Jerry's to buy whatever they could get their hands on because they thought that was it, it was done. So there, there's a, a Falernum is something I think that kind of, I think people overlook a little bit just how important it is, but it's absolutely key to all these cocktails. It is a wonderful modifier. Um, you never been thought to to expand the range a little bit, maybe something a little different, change a spice up, or you just that's it? No, because um, because falernum is something that's been handed down, um, and so I'll never mess with it. No, there will never ever. I'll never. Die. It's the same thing. Like with people ask me that sometimes they will, you know, like with with the our white rum. Yes, if you will never ever, will never ever do another, you know, brand of local white rum of a different brand will never ever do a different version of SF Heal. They're just some things you just you never touch. So um, no, we will never do a different a, a different flavor. One thing that we could do, um, which would be absolutely legit, but it's just not big enough uh, business, which is why is of course is resurrect any of the old brands. So we could in theory resurrect um, because uh, when we acquired John D. Taylor, we, always, we acquired uh, Martin Dorley, so we could re resurrect Martin Dorley uh, Falernum. We could resurrect RL Seal Falernum, obviously. We could resurrect Alianatha Falernum. Um, so we basically have a, 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 a few mothball um, Falernum recipes, um, but I, I don't have any immediate plans for that. <laughs> I think we can stick with the rum, that's fair enough. It's significantly different. You you feel the um the, the RLC. Oh, the, other, the other thing we could do, which you know has crossed my mind, was resurrecting a John D. Taylor rum. Now I don't have any reference for that, so I would basically be reinventing John D. Taylor as a rum. But I mean that's also has crossed the mind. Yeah, fair point. I mean, you're the very no. That's the thing. They're all sort of um, you know, sort of um, almond, um, sort of dominant, sort of. Yeah, no, it's not. As I say, the flurms out there weren't sort of um, a lottery. You know, they were, you know, sort of lime and almond dominant sweet. Um, yeah. Very cool. Uh, so Seth was asking about uh, the, the. Yeah, white the white. No, that's something I don't know. It's something that came around in the turn of the century. And my suspicion is, and again, it's a guess. That one of the things that happened, one of the things that did dramatically change in the turn of the century is that we were obliged to make our sugar more refined. And so what may have happened is, is that the falernum may have started to look white. Uh, and so to signify, you know, when that first sort of blender 
Um, because at the turn of the century, we had about, you know, 400 estates, you know, and all but about 10 of them making Muscovado sugar. So if you made your Falerna with that sugar, it would have been pretty dark. And, you know, up to about the 1940s, there were still about, oh, 20 or 30 estates making uh, Muscovado sugar or a very dark crystal sugar. But by about the 1950s on, nearly all of the sugar is um, yellow crystal sugar, what you guys would call brown sugar. Uh, so obviously, if you make the Flernum, I mean, people have asked me if there's, you know, what would might have changed from the past. And there are two things that would, would may have changed from the past. One, the sugar is different. Um, okay, well, could the rum be different? Uh, yes and no. I would say yes, the rum could be different from the estate rum but not in the 20th century branded rum. So as far as John D. Taylor, like for example, would have been making Falernum, he would always have been using a light column rum. So that probably would have changed, but the sugar would have changed. And the other thing would have changed is filtration because uh, Falernum is notoriously difficult to filter, which will give you some clues as to the, the, the lime juice that goes in there. Um, but it's very, very difficult. And so what, one of the things that we've had to spruce up, particularly with export, is making the, the filtration so that the product looks, um, you know, doesn't fill with, with sediment on the, in, in the bottle and stuff like that. Whereas, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, we would have been, that would have been far less of an issue. And so, so I, can, I can definitely say that we filter it differently than 20 years ago. Small quality improvements make things a little easier, I guess, as you go along. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I hesitate to show this one, but I'm going to show it anyway. Any other Falernum that are legit? No is a, a perfectly acceptable answer. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I stress that, you know, if, you, if, you, if you've created a drink and, you know, you found learn them number nine on the internet and you love your drink love your drink i'm i'm not i'm not interested in a debate as to whether your concoction is is i can only tell you what is for learn and you can decide to use it or not use it as you as you feel fit it comes back to my mantra always drink what you like but know what you're drinking so if you don't like to learn them that's fine if you like to learn them that's great if you are drinking something that's not Falernum, you should know it's not Falernum, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Sorry, comment. Um, so I think that was, I think Dan's question, I think um, the, as soon as you had the rights to uh, JD Taylor's, you, you swapped to it. So that must have been uh, the perception of quality of the brand on the island, I think, I guess was probably a, a leading thing there. Um, we have slightly more, yeah. Probably worth asking this one. Off topic question. Uh, I feel that there's going to be, there's always these ones we like to know about what's going on in the in the various parts of the world. We, we'll ask that little quick catch up at the end. Um, actually, that could be, we, we probably, we've always tended to focus a little bit on Ontario because it's a bigger market. Um, but Ontario is a, is a pain in the, or I shouldn't say it was necessarily a bigger market, but a, big, a market in which we've had uh, closer links uh, historically. Um, but to be honest with you, Ontario is a pain in the ass, and I think Quebec is a far less pain in the ass. Um, and I think really we should we should actually start to devote more attention to Quebec. Yeah, um, yeah, again, it's the world's a smaller place. I mean, for all the years we, we think about um, we think about Quebec, um, uh, Ontario, because again, you know, all the historic trade and links. But you know, I mean, I sell a tremendous amount of rum everywhere so why not come back well tremendous by our standards not tremendous by <laughs> party standards or anything so yes in other words we we need to start to you know as i say now you know we're shipping rum out to singapore and places like that that you know 10 years ago i wouldn't even have dreamed of selling rum to I mean, it's not a lot but 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 that's you know but so you know we we need to start as I say, growing up, you, you, you grew up thinking, well, I'm going to export rum, I'm going to export it to England, I'm going to export it to Canada, you know, you're going to export it to the, the historical places. And, and we've now reached a stage where we can start to think outside of that, really. So, yes, Quebec, yes, it's, it's overdue, I agree.
<laughs> I shared actually. I, I did get a, a contact from a, a nice gentleman in America asking whether Charisma Rum Cream was going to be available in America, and uh, I, I did. Yes, uh, we were working on that. Would that be via Total Wines again, or is that too early to say? Uh, no, it will be a national distribution. Cool. There you go. So soon, because that is rather lovely as well. Um, your liqueurs are fantastic. Uh, we got uh, this pretty last one. Nut, all nut allergy one is worth asking. Uh, can you? There we go. Look, Gareth, you can you can ask him yourself. I think we've uh, we've already come back. I think it's a high quality velvet being the high quality. Yeah. Oh God, uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass Letty showing mentioning that other brand. But we'll move on. If you buy it in Barbados, I can't say it's not. I mean, I don't know if they've ever changed it over the years. I'm not very familiar with it. But it, it, it does have its roots in, I mean, calling it, it, it used to be Hansel's Flurum. I don't know since it's changed hands it was, and changed names. Um, but it used to be, uh, the brand used to be Hansel's Flurum. Hansel was a, uh, did make a traditional Flurum, but no idea if it's still legit. <laughs> I'm not going to run out to buy a bottle to find out. <laughs> but uh, uh, as far as I know, that's not a, a, a exported. So that's the problem is that the, you go in the UK or the US. In, and, and and that kind of brings you back to a little bit of a point. I didn't put, put the picture of Robert Street. But if you, if you walk down Robert Street, you know, back in the 50s or 60s, you'd have probably come across at least a dozen brands of Falerna. And so if you sort of walk down that street and taste an area Falernum, you would know what is Barbados Falernum or what is Falernum is the only place making it. But if you go over to Europe or America now and you went out and said, let me start tasting Falernum, you'd have absolutely no clue whatsoever what Barbados Falernum is or original Falernum because they're all over the place. And that's the real thing about the matter. No one's stopping anyone making a wine liqueur or being inspired by Falernum. But, you know, the tragedy for me is is that that original Falernum, as is drunk in Barbados for 400 years, could well be swamped and gone. Um, and that, that's, that's the missing part. So if we allow people to just you know, put Falernum on anything, which, which unfortunately we have no control of. Um, that's what happens. I mean, there, I'm sure there are bartenders out there who you know, have various brands of Falernum and have absolutely no clue what actual Falernum tastes like. Mm. And it's not all theirs. It's just what what what's what's in front of them. So there's a question there about uh, what rum do you prefer to use in yours? Well, for oh, uh, my RL Silver Ten is my uh, my preferred um, corn and oil rum. Do you do you have a preference? Um, no. <laughs> But you're not sure what options either, are you? <laughs> um, I would say generally either um, either the vintages or Dodie's five or, or else he'll ten. In other words, I wouldn't you know I wouldn't go and make a corn and oil with, with diadem. I mean, for all I know, it might make great corn and oil. <laughs> I, tend, I tend to think a little old school when I think corn and oil. So therefore, um, for me, a Dodie's five makes a the most textbook corn oil that I can think of. Yeah, there's a thing. I say my in our um, in our family, my uh, my mother-in-law likes to. Uh, she doesn't drink rum, but she does like to drink a little um, falernum with ice. That's her uh, her tipple at Christmas. That is, because because any any more often than that would be ridiculous. Obviously. But, uh, yeah. Well, one of the things that's happened, I it, it probably was always seasonal, but it's it, it's now very seasonal in Barbados. So, um, because you know, as our society developed, people just hundreds of different liqueurs and drinks out of there. So, this is one of the things that happens to indigenous products that you know they get swamped by the foreign products, the foreign market, and everything. And this is how we lose a lot of ind indigenous products. But so, one of the things that happened about it is it's, it's still very much alive in Barbados, but it's very seasonal. So and again, that also shows the wider way in which it is consumed. So in, um, it'll find a, a lot of it, its use in Christmas and in cooking. Um, and we use it, um, me, you know, this is um, Gail and I personally, when we do rum cake, we not only use rum, but we use flour as well. Yeah. 
Oh, makes sense. Now, and for those that uh, don't know me, my, my mother-in-law is Barbadian as well, so I so say she's the authentic real deal. <laughs> Good question there today. So do you think, um, is it is it still being used? I mean, we see all the various um, quality bartenders based in um, Barbados are, are still bigging up for Learnham. Um, but uh, how well, do you I, I mean, it depends which period, as they say, different people drank it different ways. So um, I do think it was drunk kind of like a wine back in the a day, in other words, or, or what we would now describe as a liqueur. So, um, in other words, a straight a straight drink. Um, but it also had different uses. You know, it was very revered. So, you know, um, I mean, like my father, if he has a cough, he swear by a shot of learning. Um, there's a lot of that. Um, it was obviously drunk. But as I mentioned earlier, when we see the creation of cocktails in the turn of the century, that's where we see it making it. And it's in the corn oil, um, secondarily, but two original Flernum cocktails are the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club cocktail and the Green Swizzle of the Bridgetown Club. Green Swizzle being Flernum only or Flernum and no, rum? Flernum and rum, we're bitters. Um, I feel like that's something I need tonight. <laughs> Some crushed ice is going to be well, the, 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 the green came from from the wood wormwood worm, worm bitters, which are not necessarily green, but um, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so anyhow, yeah. So that was the green the green swizzle, and apparently that was well as I showed you the here we go the find the here we go. The Times, uh, the most important chapter was, so this is a review on this um, book, uh, A Note on West Indian Drinks. And the portion of the book, the most important chapter will be de devoted to the Green Swizzle, indigenous to the, book, to the Bridgetown Club. So there's a whole, a whole chapter in this book. And, and also here in 1908 San Francisco, a wise man tells of swizzles and swizzle sticks. Um, right, you know. The most popular swizzle, the famous green swizzle, cannot be procured in San Francisco because no one to who up to the present has seen fit to import the ingredients and the swizzle sticks. So I could, uh, at the beginning of lockdown, I created the uh, the Instagram account, JDT Velvet for Learnham, uh, with a view to sharing um, the various uses that um, where people are tagging into it. And I have to say that people are the the, the variety. We always associate rum and for Learnham, obviously, because that's a that's our kind of thing. But for Learnham crops up in all manner of cocktails all over the place. It's surprising. So this this book is the other insight into how it was drunk here. So this is an excerpt from a book called Creolana Creoliana, which is basically talking about social life in Barbados. It's published back in 1842. And um, basically saying a wine uh, is very rarely drunk, uh, other than on weddings, christenings, birthdays, and then it will usually be, as they say, Madeira was the, was the popular stuff. And then the industrious and independent planter being content to regale himself and his friends and improve punch in Florida. So th this was their everyday drink. <laughs> And Bub or Blackstrap is another um, uh, old cocktail. Um, it's in this book as well. Bub or it's called Bub or Blackstrap. Um, I can't remember what it is, but it's it's, it's also in this 1911 recipe book. Fantastic, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, it was just as interesting as I remember it. Um, uh, so uh, I think we'll just use this before we say goodbye. We use this little opportunity. We don't get a chance to chat to you very often. Any any updates you'd like to share with us from uh, from from Barbados? I will say that DHL delivered a little Mark fourteen to me today, which was rather sweet. So we're kind of looking forward to that. Oh, you got your uh, detente. I might have done. Yes. All uh, right. I okay. might have a little. I have a little sip of that. It's very difficult to put the bottle back down again afterwards. I'm, just, I'm going to say that now. Um, for those uh, in Europe, uh, middle of uh, October feels very, very likely at the moment. Obviously, the UK and well, everywhere's subject to all kinds of funny things happening at the moment. That COVID thing just won't disappear off. But we're very, very, very confident that Rum Week and Detente will collide in a most delicious manner. Um, but this is probably going to be more than just the UK. It's going to be a bit wider than that. So um, so that's quite cool. Um, 
and we're obviously anxiously awaiting any news of uh, of future exceptional cast selections. Please, how any any updates on um, the GI that you might want to share with us at this uh, point? Um, no, nothing really too too much. Um, but I do think the shit's going to hit the fan pretty soon. <laughs> so. yes. Wonderful. Um, uh, Villiers, any, any new Villiers uh, that you might want to share with us? Yes, that is currently being worked on. Um, it's uh, People don't realize how fast time flies. I mean, it sort of announced, um, you know, Deton, and it was like, oh, hey, another one. It was like, well, Sagacity was over a year ago. Sagacity was last August. And then I announced Red Tab. And it was like, oh, my God, another one. I said, well, there's Nobillary. Nobillary was last December. Okay, so that one's a little early. Well, not really. I mean, it, because by the time it gets Breda Tab gets to England, it'll be like about November, and you know, Nobillary was there like probably like about January. So it's okay. It's like about two months in less than a year, and so yes, um, plenty potentiario. It's it's coming up to a year, so there it is time. It is time, and it is um, the design has been uh, the, 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 everything is. It's named and the label has been done and and it's all happening and the, and the the casts are staring at me right in the distillery area that have been pulled from the from the from the um, aging bonds and uh, yeah um, that one's coming fantastic well uh, I think we've uh, I think we covered all that. Uh... I think we've got all the right questions there. Oh, is that Dan gone? Dan, privateer casks. Privateer casks, have they arrived yet? Oh, there, that was a fishing question or not? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, there's, there's, uh, there's no, no privateer casks are, are coming here. Uh, he's um, speculating. <laughs> well, there's a little fishing. There's no harm in a little fishing. Yeah, yeah, he's trying, yeah, he's, he's trying to be um, uh, uh, clever. <laughs> Bless him. Uh, right, oh, will make me think he knows more than you know, <laughs> that, that went wrong. There's no private cat here, cast. <laughs> uh, I'm in this one. I, I quite you're you're a you're an influential chap, but um, the yeah the, the problems with TTB and releasing this stuff that was uh, I think that's just something you'll have to just deal with the TTB as you, as and when you can. It really not like you say that. Yeah, no, there's nothing you can do about that. So what happens is is you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. I mean, the good thing, I mean, the actual real positive about that is the fact that the TTB is moving faster than ever, and so what's happening is is that you would normally, you know, get your TTB application in, assuming that it was going to be weeks and weeks and weeks. And so by the time you were ready to, you know, the bottle of TTB application will be holding you up. And so you send it in and boom, it comes back really fast. And so suddenly the TTB is the one who's the next in your realm. And, <laughs> and not you. So, I mean, it's actually, that that's the good part. But yeah, I, I have no idea this, this quaint, because you would have thought that in the US, uh, you know, the commercial powers that be would have long, you know, sort of asked the TDB to say, listen, you know, labels are confidential things. Um, you know, what, I mean, first of all, why is there a label approval? That's a, that's a, a hangover from, from prohibition. And there is um, this thing where they have to publish it. And it's, it's, it's bizarre. And you know, the T there's a wonderful article out about the TTB. I need to post it, and it really shows you how completely inadequate um, their classifications are. Mm. Um, you know how very uh, Eurocentric they are, um, and it, and and it's a source of frustration. So you you know they have a very. I mean, we're we're lucky we make rub. Um, and we're also we're also lucky in the sense that um, they never seem to have much of a problem with spice rum. I mean, it's a it's a it's a distill. So what they do at the TB, which this article addresses, is they you know they have a few of the the, the, the well recognized categories, and so you have you know great subcategories of whiskey and stuff like that. But more or less, you dump everything else into this catch-all category called distilled spirit specialty. And of course, when you're in this catch-all ca category, you're not supposed to confuse it with the other categories. 
So if you make a spice rum, it's no longer rum, but then you're not supposed to mislead anybody that it's rum. So we're yeah. actually lucky that they let us call it spice rum fairly prominently. And it'll be curious when we jump the, we, we've had Chrisma there before, but it'll still be curious to see when we reapply for the Chrisma rum cream liqueur. Um, because again, we have to apply as a distilled spirit specialty because they don't have, oh, will it meet liqueur? I'll have to check and see. I'll have to check and see. I haven't crossed that bridge. But let's say when you lump it there, then you have to be very careful that you don't, in theory, then the word rum can't be very big because it's not a rum. So anyway, we'll see. We'll, see. we'll, 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 we'll get there. But yeah, I mean, no, no such pain in the ass in more or less the rest of the world. <laughs> um, yeah. you, know, you sort of, if you have an illegal label, you do it at your own risk. So, you know, you read your regulations and you make sure the label is compliant and off you go, but there's no pre, there's no pre-approval, you know? Mm. Yeah, TTB have been spoiling surprises for a long time, haven't they? Um, cool. I'd say thank you very much for your time, Richard. As always, that was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, we'll try and check in again in uh, a, a few weeks or whatever, and maybe we'll, once the taunt certainly is out there, whether we'll, we'll have the pleasure of your company in the UK or not. A wrong week, well, this to be seen. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. 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 Two unknowns at the moment, I think. But um, I'll say thank you very much for, for everyone and for, for tuning in. There's been um, some great coverage tonight, lots of great questions, lots of great comments. Um, so thank you, guys. Uh, we'll see you on and on. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah.